Cool. So this um, is basically a session about how we can hold our, the networks that we use accountable and the open source tooling and stuff that is useful uh, on the technical side to do that. And then some of the policy thoughts around how we have gotten to where we are and, and the different forces that we're combating and why the internet is structured the way it is. Um, I'm Will. Uh, I finished uh, the PhD program at UW uh, last, last year uh, in the networking lab. Um, starting a postdoc at University of Michigan uh, in computer security stuff. Um, yeah, and, and my, my focus of that work has been sort of on the technical side, looking at uh, online censorship, looking at how we can measure the internet, uh, understand um, who is doing what, what sites are accessible or inaccessible where, uh, and just trying to get more insight into this large system that we're using all the all the time. So what is accountability? Just to sort of start so that we're all in the same place. I think we all have sort of like had this thought of there was this whole SOPA thing when we were successful maybe where the whole internet community sort of had this online protest. We, we really got behind it, called our representatives and managed to prevent a set of laws uh, that would have added additional regulation and additional restrictions on user generated content and on what was online um, and were able to sort of shift the public opinion in order to cause those not to get passed. Uh, and that we see that in sort of a bunch of major sites really went black. Um, we've also had um, success in sort of having this grassroots accountability against companies, right? So when someone like Facebook or Google um, starts doing things that are really out of line with societal norms, um, you see these backlashes of public pressure on these companies forcing them to change policies. So um, there was a, a period, you know, I mean, Facebook always gets dinged for its privacy policies, but there actually have been times where they've walked back steps, and same with Google, where it will do these things. Um, people will get mad and say, well, actually, that's, that's really limiting the way that I'm using these services, and then you'll see that changing. And so the question is, how do we have this, how do we maintain our ability to influence these norms, and how do we keep this internet that we all enjoy and use um, something that that is conducive for our free open source environment, so that new projects can show up? It stays sort of this democratic thing that is for the users. Um, as we continue to head down this road, where um, all of the money is coming out of companies, and and we have really more and more this dialogue between corporate players and governments, and the users are sort of being sold to somehow. Um, and that's, that's sort of, I don't know, the, the context here. So I want to start by spending a little bit of time talking about the regulatory landscape focused on the US, but looking at sort of what all of this FCC stuff that we've heard in the news is actually sort of uh, looking at, and then more specifically, what is happening at a local level. So um, you've got a bunch of individual cities like Seattle, and Tacoma and so forth who are then trying to have these laws on, on internet um, ISPs as well um, in place of what they see the FCC not doing. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll move into sort of the, the meat technically, which is these projects for measuring what's actually happening so that we can respond to them. And then we'll, we'll finish by how those different pieces fit together and how we use these technical things to then come back to the policy side. Cool, and I'll leave some time at the end for questions. Feel free to interrupt if you want more detail on anything or, or if, if there's um, anything else that I'm, I'm missing. Um, I think this is, this is meant for you guys to get something out of this, hopefully. So uh, if, you, if you feel like you're not getting something, please uh, you know, make, this, make this for you. Cool, so what, what are the, the different pressures? So we've heard a lot about the FCC, right? This is the Federal Communication Commission is this regulatory body that is somehow in charge of the internet as we use it in some sense. What does that really mean? Um, the FCC has sort of a pretty broad mandate. Uh, one of those pieces of what it does is consumer protection. So it is meant to somehow set these regulatory 
things on our ISPs and carriers, but also on mail delivery and on a bunch of physical world things that happened earlier. So TV, radio, all of these other types of communication. The FCC is charged with basically having this environment where multiple people are able to compete fairly, um, dealing with sort of consumer rights at the same time. So making this a thing that isn't just a monopoly that wins. Um, and so they, they get sort of the ability to find each of these companies for not complying with regulations that they set. Um, you know, when you think about the bread and butter of what the FCC has been doing, it's these like spectrum auctions and figuring out what part of these constrained resources like the RF spectrum, different companies and technologies get to use. Um, so when you get into broadband internet and things uh, that are using like cable, that are using these, these landlines, it's less of a constrained environment in FCC's sort of traditional bread and butter thing. So they've been hesitant to say, you know, do we regulate this in the same way? Because it's not that multiple people are trying to use the same RF space and competing with each other directly. It's more, well, us Comcast, we laid all these cables and we're using it and you could also lay your cables um, is sort of this other argument of, well, this is constrained in a different way. Uh, at what point do we say, well, these local governments have given you um, monopolistic um, like cost concessions such that you were able to do this cheaper in order to blanket everyone. And so now you are the common infrastructure. And like telephones before, we're going to say you need to let other people use this infrastructure that is now a public service. So we're this, this is sort of the debate we're having. Um, we've seen a lot of, I don't know, very scared and scary articles in the news recently about how the FCC is going to undo net neutrality, uh, that, we're, that we're losing this. Um, and so this is focused on a couple things. Um, in 2015-ish, we saw regulation out of the FCC saying that they were going to start having broadband internet uh, classified as a common carrier. So what is a common carrier? This is this sort of definition that isn't there's no like one place you can go that just is like, this is what a common carrier is. Instead, it's like a bunch of different court rulings for the last hundred years, um, starting with packet transit of, okay, so we've got USPS and now we've got these things like FedEx coming in and they're also going to do package shipment. They're going to allow packages to be shipped from anyone. And so what sort of regulations do we need to put on these new companies? Because if we just sort of let them do it, they'll take the profitable segment of USPS, right? They'll, they'll do, deal with these high value packages, but they won't deliver to the rural areas because that's expensive and not worth it. And so what we'll end up with is USPS not making any money and failing, and then we end up with worse infrastructure. So at some point, these things grow big enough because there is this value to be made and they are getting the value out of this segment of the market. And the government needs to say, well, we need you to play fair. And so we need you to also let us like, you know, have regulatory concessions so that we still get these things that we want for consumers, like ability to deliver packages everywhere. Um, so there's a couple things that come out of that. Um, one of the ones that we are seeing sort of being the, the crux of this net neutrality thing is that anyone is allowed to deliver, to sort of put packages into the system at the same cost. So if FedEx becomes classified as a common carrier, it means that USPS can also ship packages over FedEx if it wants, right? And FedEx can't say, well, you're our competitor, so we're gonna charge you five times as much. Um, that they have to allow, not based on who it is, everyone gets to use you. Um, and you can't sort of have this anti-competitive thing where other systems can't use you. So there's this interoperability and now what we're seeing that be you know, applied to in the internet context is you, know, you need to still let Netflix send its videos over your line even though you also have a video service. Um, and so can you charge for different content providers more? Um, it also basically says the, client, like the users get to choose what they ship so you can't look into it and say, well, you know, since you're shipping, you know, a typewriter and we don't like typewriters because that's going to like cause digital things, we're going to charge more for typewriters. So that the different contents of what's inside need to sort of not matter, right? Your, the, the things you are shipping 
you know, you can you can vary by weight or something like that, but you can't be like, well, this is like a business letter, so for business letters, we're going to charge ten times as much because we know that's worth money. Um, that that you that you are held to some sort of common levels of not being able to care as much about the contents or who it is, um, and you're doing this sort of for everyone as a basic service. Okay, so. At play in this current FCC world is how much we want to regulate ISPs, and the the reality is not the FCC gets rid of this common carrier definition, and then suddenly your data is like wholesale sold by all of these companies for you know to the lowest bidder. That's not necessarily what's going to happen. Probably it's not going to be what happens because consumers would be super mad and when the company just internally is looking at that business practice, hopefully it doesn't make sense to them. What, it, what we're really looking at is what sort of regulation at that bottom line do we want to ensure for our ISPs? So do we need to say, Comcast, you need to serve everyone, or do we give them these opportunities to innovate where, yeah, Google is gonna pay Comcast a bunch of money to make Google really fast, right? This, this could be an opportunity, it could move Google forward, we get new lines faster because it's clearly economically advantageous for Google to put a bunch of money or whatever Netflix, some specific carrier, is going to be super happy to pay for interconnect bandwidth to get this new gigabit for itself. Uh, and that's a much easier thing for it to swallow than we're gonna put a bunch of money into infrastructure that everyone gets to use, right? If they see this competitive advantage, maybe they're going to, uh, you know, be more willing to invest in that infrastructure. So this is the argument that the Republican side is making, right? This is the, we should not regulate, the industry is going to regulate itself side, right? They're saying we're going to get some small percentage of these new innovative services that are going to be able to move faster because they get to without having to spread that out. And on the other side, um, which is what we saw on the Obama era more, was well, we need everyone to have access, and we want new players who don't have that money to invest to also take advantage, because it's these new services in the internet side that we keep seeing doing cool new things, and the internet as this common platform means that they can have this equal platform and can then sort of quickly expand, because they don't have to then relay their lines or pay some huge amount of money to the existing players. So this is the balance that we're trying to find, is, is how how much of that common ground we want to, to see on the internet. Um, and right now we're seeing that um, the current FCC administration is rolling back the, the protections. And so some of these, like we're going to likely see a reclassification away from common carrier pretty soon uh, in this year. We already saw a Trump executive order uh, in February that uh, undid this thing about whether uh, ISPs can sell user data. That was again, sort of made to look very scary if you saw it. Uh, basically what it was doing was near the uh, end of the previous uh, administration, uh, they, they were scheduling these rules to go into effect and now they will never go into effect. But it's not rules that we have had in the past ever either. Um, so it's whether we were going to do that in this year or not and now we're no longer going to put these into effect. So uh, companies have always been able to sell our data and now we'll continue to be able to sell our data uh, is, is the, the state of the world. Uh, now, filling in that gap, uh, a bunch of cities and, and more local uh, provinces or like ed governments have said, well, maybe that was a good idea, uh, and maybe we have leverage to do this instead of the, the full federal government. Um, so if you look at Seattle, which is the location I am most familiar with, um, we have a bunch of protection things for consumers that, that as the local government has set up, it, it has entailed. So there is a cable customer bill of rights, which says that as a cable operator, you need to you know be responsive to customer phone calls for support. Um, and also that there's some privacy restrictions about you can't sell um, you know what channels your users are looking at in specific ways uh, or use them in some ways. Um, and a couple years ago, the, the Comcast franchise in Seattle got renewed for another 10 years, right? So this is, uh, again, at the local level, doing something very similar to what I was talking about at the federal level. Seattle said, we will give you um, guaranteed lowest cost, so we won't let anyone else lay um, cable lines uh, in the city 
for cheaper than you can. So if we let someone else lay their fiber and say, you can do this and we will charge you, you know, $100 per block for, um, for, for digging up a street and, and you can do that, then we have to also give Comcast the option to do the same thing. So, so Comcast gets sort of preferred customer status um, that, we, that we promise not to undersell you. In exchange, you need to comply with some regulations. And those regulations typically are access of saying you need to be willing to provide service to everyone in the city. So you can't just do downtown, but if someone in South Center who's still in the city limits wants your service, you need to pay that more expensive cost to get them service too. Um, because we want all of our you know, citizens in our city to have access to internet. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give you these concessions like you can use, you, you can dig up our roads or you can use the, the common telephone lines that, that are government owned property and we will charge you less. But in exchange, you have to be willing to serve anyone who wants your service. Um, and so when you look at that negotiation of what they're trying to get, it's things like libraries all get $10 per month internet um, and like senior centers will get this discounted rate and we will have these low income uh, tiered buckets. These are the things that the city has traditionally been negotiating for, is getting access to everyone, right? So again, we're, are we expanding out and doing something that is less cost efficient for these providers? Um, in the wake of this most recent FCC thing, Seattle uh, passed a regulation saying, we are basically going to take the wording of that FCC regulation and we're going to apply this to our cable TV franchises as a thing that they have to comply with. So they can't, they need to obtain permission from their users before they sell any web browsing history. So if they're, if they're looking at what web requests are going over your pipe, they need to somehow get explicit consent from you. Who knows how that's actually gonna happen uh, before they can sell this to third parties. Um, I, th I think they I get, think yeah, so I think the it basic, was just announced a couple of days ago. yeah, it, it was just announced. I, I, I think basically the deal is that they get some ability to do regulation authority as part <coughs> of that franchise for, op for people operating. And so they, they can have these new rules that they put in. It's not modifying the contract per se, like directly, where they need new signatures or something, but it's like you're operating within our jurisdiction and and, and we can have these penalties to fine you or say you're not in compliance anymore if you if you aren't complying. Um, but it, but the, the companies that they have leverage over are these cable providers who are in these franchise agreements where they're getting something out of the city. Um, so this doesn't apply to AT&T and Verizon and any of our cell providers who have built their cell towers on private buildings primarily, right? So, so when you look at how our wireless and cell providers are working, they'll go to these real estate developers and they'll say, you, you, you've got a pretty nice building, can we put a micro cell on top of it? And that's a purely private agreement where the city isn't um, involved at all, right? They're, the, those national wireless or cell providers are primarily dealing with FCC only because they have spectrum regulation about airspace, but that's, that's an agreement between them and the federal government, not between them and the municipalities. Okay, so the other thing that I think, okay, yeah. Do you know if the ISP can deny you service if you don't have let them sell to the browser history? Like hide it in their subscriber agreement and you have to agree to the subscriber agreement in order to use their service? So I think in something like Seattle with this sort of thing, the I think the expectation is no. I think the problem is when Again, when you get out to rural areas and places where there's, there actually is this monopoly situation where there's one provider, um, you may find yourself in a situation where you either are paying this company that is going to do this or you yeah. don't have internet. Uh, and then you're in sort of a much harder position. I think in most of these municipality, uh, more urban areas, we're unlikely to see this happen in Sensi um, because there is this competition and uh, it's pretty clear to these companies that there is this degree of, of user, um, I don't know, feeling uncomfortable about having their data sold. So it would automatically opted out of selling. Right, so, so the city rules are saying by default you're opted out and you need to opt in. You need to like consent somehow explicitly before we're allowed to do this. 
and this this means more than you need to send us you know the postcard within thirty days uh, of of starting service in order to to explicitly opt yeah. out, right? That that it actually has to be an opt in process. So we'll see. Maybe that's a click through as part of your your sign up <coughs> that you know you have to like you know you sort of keep clicking and oops, but for now you're good. So the other thing that motivates these players is corporate liability. And this is a lot of sort of the other side is the companies that are in this space don't want to get sued and don't want to have people mad at them. Um, and so they think about this in terms of liability. And this is what causes us to get this more restrictive side of things not being allowed or things being sort of disincentivized, right? And so this is things like defamation, libel, slander. So if a newspaper posts something that is mean to someone, they could face a lawsuit. Um, or if Google has content on it that someone gets mad at, they could sue Google for hosting this content that they say is untrue about them. You've got companies worried about the government coming after them and doing investigations for terrorism or things of that nature. Right? If if I have you know a chat program or whatever and it gets used by people for nefarious purposes, I am at much more risk of someone now saying, You're, you have all this content that is part of our investigation, you need to comply with our investigation, and that's expensive. So if you have a platform like Facebook or, or Google or whatever, you're going to try and shape your community norms so you don't have this problem in the first place. You're going to try and limit the content that you're accepting to not face security problems or copyright violation problems. Um, this other one, CIPA, is the Child Protection Act, right? If you if you're have content that uh, the government can say is targeted at children 13 or under, so or you allow signups of users 13 or under knowingly, you now face a lot more regulation and scrutiny of what you're doing. Uh, and there's a bunch of uh, liability that comes with that in the form of being able to be sued for um, showing inappropriate content to them, um, for releasing any of their private information for children. Um, so if, if you get hacked, this is now a big problem for you because the government can take large amounts of money from you um, for, for losing children's information. Um, a lot of how uh, FTC, Federal Trade Commission, and, and these consumer protection agencies have sort of gone after uh, a bunch of internet service services um, traditionally has been under the CIPA Act because it is very strong. So if you have a service and we can show that children are using it, then we need to, then you get to be held to a much higher standard. And so if you do other things that we don't like, we go after you with CIPA and say, you aren't you know, doing a good job of protecting children, shape up, pay us a bunch of money. Um, so this, is, this gets used as a stick some. Um, <coughs> but these are the things that cause us to have a much more restricted space online. Right. This is these are the things that are motivating Facebook and how it's shaping its platform, or Twitter, or Google, or any of these walled garden platforms that we use. Is that they they like user comments and discussion because that drives engagement, and you look at more of their ads and you buy more things. But they'd really like that to be you talking about products that you will buy rather than you talking about you know anything, including these things that could get them in trouble. So there's a lot of incentive against neutrality and allowing users to talk about whatever they want, right? Um, for the companies, this is about getting money. How do they maximize revenue? Well, they maximize revenue by showing you things that are expensive or, or that they make money off of, like videos and uh, traditional media streams. Um, and if you don't have neutrality, then these big players who have the money to pay ISPs more, you know, they're pretty happy about this too. Right, so the ISPs are happy because they get <laughs> less regulation. They don't have to, to go out to all of these places as much. The companies are happy because, you know, as Netflix, yeah, I've got the money to pay for that top tier, and now someone new can't come and easily compete with me. Um, and potentially, from the government's perspective, well, cool, innovation happens. Right, that that you know, Google's going to pay a huge amount of money to get this new thing, or we're going to have satellites now, or whatever. So there's a bunch of incentives that are pulling us away from a neutral internet at all of these different levels, um, from, from that consumer walled garden space and then from the ISP space. 
Um, right, we have, we have why, why do we want to allow any content and commentary? Well, because that has a lot of risk for the companies. And it means that you know, it's harder for us to watch what's actually happening because this is now sort of unfold safe. <coughs> so uh, there are these forces, and it's worth understanding these forces. And now we need to figure out how we push back and say, well, but really, we want a neutral internet. And really, we want a place where we you know, understand that this innovation is coming from new services starting up. And in order for them to do that, there needs to be this very level playing ground. Okay. Part two, technical, technical responses. Uh, how, we, how we hold the internet accountable. Um, so I'm gonna talk about four different technical projects that are going on that monitor different parts of the internet uh, and that provide accountability and let us see what is actually happening. Uh, and this is at the technical level because one of the things that is, I think, proven useful is being able to talk about this stuff from a point of having data. Um, if, if I am just arguing about policy and saying, well, that's bad, it's really a lot harder to have that, to win that argument because uh, from this previous side, we've just seen that there are pretty reasonable arguments on both sides. And, and it's really sort of this someone trying to think about, well, okay, which of these seems like a good way going forward. Uh, if we have data to throw at it and say, well, look, when you do this, it goes down, um, that's, that's a thing that's much harder to argue with. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is a project called OODI, the Open Observatory of Network <coughs> Interference. This is a project affiliated with Tor, uh, the anonymity network, and is looking specifically at online censorship. Um, so can we find the technical infrastructure that is blocking content? Um, can we watch where that is around the world? Can we see what it is blocking? Um, this year, they came out with a uh, app, uh, mobile app for Android and iOS. Uh, you can download this, it's called Uni. Um, and basically you run it and it tries a bunch of web requests and it looks for a few things. It looks for, are there proxies that are obviously watching uh, the content that you're, that you're accessing? Um, and so for, for typically not ISP level, but for uh, coffee, coffee shop uh, or um, corporate proxy, uh, so if you're within a corporation, a school, one of these smaller organizations. Uh, and then in some countries, at a national level, uh, you see these uh, devices that are really actively sort of processing all web requests. Uh, so whenever I make a request, this box sort of looks at the contents of the request I'm making and then forwards it on. And if you make weird requests, you can notice that the request you made that the server saw is slightly different from the request you actually made. And so it, it's looking for these it's doing speed tests to see how fast of a connection you're get to getting to different places. And it looks for uh, it's spe uh, specific websites that don't load, that should load. Uh, and so they've got a list uh, of websites that are considered sensitive sort of in different places around the world that they'll ping and see if they can connect to. Um, this is sort of their, their web console where you can tell you know, uh, for, for common things like a WhatsApp or for vanilla you know, for, for these proxy systems, do they work? Um, and you can go to their website and then see where they see in instances of censorship. So you know, a bunch of countries are actively blocking content. Um, this is more sort of that, I think the last round of internet freedom uh, where we were looking at you know, the traditional China is blocking things and you know, Russia is blocking things and we've got our West free world versus these censoring repressive states. Uh, and I think the battle that we are fighting now is a different one. Uh, and this, these tools are trying to catch up to that. Um, but, but we're still in this world of saying, okay, so there's this person in the network that is explicitly blocking my access to information. Uh, and this is still a valuable thing to be able to monitor, although it's not something that I think we would expect to happen in the US super soon. So this is, these, these things are saying we were able to see that there is a one of these boxes and we know who made it. Um, so there's these companies like Blue Coat and Finfisher, <coughs> which are Western companies that sell proxy devices that <coughs> countries like Russia and India and, and the Middle East uh, buy and then use to block content. And so um, 
one of the sort of then responses from, from activists is saying, well, these companies that are operating within our set of social norms in a liberal uh, Western Europe that, that believes that access to information should be free are selling these tools that are used to block access to information. And why are we providing the technical capacity to these people that we're calling repressive to be repressive? We should hold these companies accountable and tell them not to sell to these people. Um, and so they're trying to chart who actually has this and are you going against any of these um, trade embargoes uh, and, and are you sort of actually behaving as a good corporate citizen or not? I think the useful base tools that have come out of Uni, um, there is a C library that's being used sort of under the hood that it uses for all of its measurements. It's called Measurement Kit that is a pretty reasonable basic framework for conducting internet measurements uh, and for sort of <laughs> doing measurements um, from a broad set of devices around the internet. And that is a tool that is, if you are thinking of trying to get measurements of the internet, this is a great place to start. Um, because adding modules to that to measure new things means that it can sort of then get adopted by a lot of existing users. Um, there's also a URL list that sort of is maintained by a group called Citizen Lab, which operates out of uh, University of Toronto. And that is basically the list of what websites maybe are on the verge of being blocked or manipulated by different governments. So it has basically segments for each country and it is an interesting place to look at of what are the sites that are sort of on this edge where we are watching for them as test cases. Um, and it ends up being sort of a hand curated list by a bunch of political scientists of, you know, well, gay rights is an issue in this country, so we're going to have a couple, you know, pretty vanilla like sites in that in that range, or or it's pornography, so we're gonna have, you know, some softcore porn sites in the in this country that we're watching to see if these get blocked, it's an indication that policy is changing. Um, Um, satellite is a project that I worked on um, uh, as part of my PhD. This is looking at specifically do websites uh, resolve and where do they resolve to. Uh, and so you're able to see a couple things. You're able to see, um, this is in Iran, how many websites are blocked over time uh, from outside. So I've got a single server running at University of Washington and it has this sort of graph for a bunch of different countries. Um, and the Interesting thing that you get out of this is two things. One is uh, I'm not putting people at risk. There's no one in Iran running measurements, which is nice. Um, but that's purely on the censorship side. The other thing that's interesting is you get the sense of where are people located running. So for Google, where are Google's servers? Where has its CDN expanded to and who is it peering with? Um, this is a nice thing to know. And so we want to watch companies where they physically are uh, and where users get to see them. And so this is now, I think still looking more at the, the worldwide internet. So this question that sort of I think goes back to, to local more is if, if Facebook expands into China and is complying with Chinese policy to take down things, they're now accepting not only the restrictions and regulations that they're getting from the US, but also the restrictions and regulations they're getting from China or from Turkey. Uh, and you see this sort of calculus of the companies that are now for, for the broad media platforms that we're using uh, regularly are mostly international. Um, they have to make these decisions about content, not simply under a US law and regulation system, but about under 200 different regulation systems from all of the different countries that have users and apply pressure to them. Uh, so it's really interesting to watch, okay, so Twitter suddenly now has servers in Turkey and guess what? They've also started to remove a bunch of tweets from Turkish users. Um, watching them remove the tweets from Turkish users is pretty hard because it's within their walled garden and they will rate limit you, especially with things like Facebook where it's not public. It's really hard for us to watch and see what content is allowed and is not, right, in a, in a data-driven way because that's something that is private within their platform, right? I can't tell if a specific Facebook community has been somehow closed because the community was not necessarily public in the first place. But what I can see is has Facebook expanded to another country? And if it has, and it has physical infrastructure there, that's a pretty good indication that it's now complying with the regulations from that country. Um, so we're a level off from direct measurement of, well, what norms are you allowing? Um, but it's some level of insight. Um, 
to give you a taste of how this works, there are a bunch of DNS resolvers around the world. There's roughly 8 million of them. Um, and so I can look up where is Facebook.com from all of these DNS resolvers, <coughs> and they'll tell me what they see. Uh, so I find a DNS server in Turkey, and I say, hey, you, tell me who Facebook is, and it will say, oh, it's this IP address, and I can look at where that IP address is, and there I, then I can figure out, okay, so people in Turkey probably see Facebook at this IP address. Um, and so the basic thing is we're looking at a little over a million different ISP networks, um, and we, 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 every week we look up the top 10,000 domains that Alexa knows about on all of them, and we see where everyone thinks all of these domains are. Um, we've got three or four years of, of data of that answer, and then some analysis that are up online. Cool. The third project is a thing called Measurement Lab, or MLab. Uh, this is a collaboration between a bunch of people at Google and a bunch of people at Open Text Institute, which is this weird policy group. Um, and it is specifically trying to get better speed data and look at net neutrality. So we're going to now look at this, are we getting this level playing field in terms of speed for different services? Um, the basic argument of why we need this project is when I go to speedtest.net, uh, what am I actually looking at, right? I like, I get 50 megabytes. Great, what does that mean? Um, well, speedtest.net, it turns out, is this company that has servers that you are hitting, and those servers are owned actually by your ISP. So Comcast has said, oh, hey, speedtest, we're happy to host your speedtest.net servers, and we'll put them in Comcast. And so you get 50 megabits per second from your house to your ISP, but does that really mean that you get 50 megabits per second from your house to the website that you're going to? Well, maybe, but not necessarily. Um, and so a study that came out in 2015 uh, by them called the ISP Interconnection and its Impact on Consumer Internet Performance was saying that it's really the place between the ISPs that is the bottleneck. The reason why my internet might be slow is not from me to Comcast. That's gonna be fine, probably. They've got enough, a big enough pipe there, but they are not paying enough to connect to the next people on. Um, and they're not paying enough because, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, so it has a bunch of graphs uh, in it, uh, but this was sort of this argument that they were trying to make through the government for more regulation, saying, well, look, when we look at these ISPs uh, going up to, from, from Cogent, which is one of these backbone providers, we see that you know for a while they just sort of went down. Like they had the bandwidth, and then for a period of like, a year, they, there's way less bandwidth. And that was also the period where Netflix was getting a bunch of pressure to pay money to the content providers. Um, and then Netflix started paying money, and then suddenly there's more bandwidth again. Um, and this, this feels a little sketchy somehow, like they had the bandwidth and were just sort of holding out on it. Um, and the basic argument is, well, okay, so you've got this cable where you are connecting between Comcast and uh, Level 3 or Cogent or, or one of these backbone providers that has a bunch of service data, and maybe there is more traffic that wants to go across that link than that cable. And you've got a network that is passing a huge amount of traffic, and they have a network that is passing a huge amount of traffic, and are you going to put another cable in to get more traffic to go back and forth? Well, you could do that, or you could say, hey, you should pay us a bunch of money so that we do that. Um, and it turned out that a bunch of consumer ISPs have been, so, so the, the Comcast and Time Warner Cable and whatever of the world, have been pressuring these companies and saying, hey, uh, in order for us to you know, build out this infrastructure that's expensive for us, you should give us a bunch of money. Uh, and the content providers like Netflix and Facebook and whatever are saying, well, no, this is you know, not the way we've always done it. The traffic both ways is about equal. And so this should be the traditional free pairing agreement where neither of us pay money to each other and we just keep putting in cables because we have more traffic. But the traffic's going both ways. Like people want this, they're paying you. Our people are delivering the content and are paying us. We should be interconnecting to keep the service up. Um, but the 
arguments from Comcast and people is, well, our eyes are very valuable to you. You are making money off of, your customers are making money off of our customers and clearly want the bandwidth. So you should give us money. Um, and that continues to be this debate. But um, Measurement Lab is putting servers for speed tests at these interconnection points and on both sides and trying to do speed tests to something further away than your local ISP so that you <coughs> understand the speed not into Comcast, but the speed across Comcast to the next hop. Um, and so things like the Uni speed test are using their servers, a bunch of um, sort of the next generation of speed tests that you use. If you use Netflix's uh, fast.net speed test, um, you're now hitting servers that are sort of past your local ISP and getting a sense of what is your internet speed not into your ISP, so not like that link from your home to the cable company, but your link actually to some service provider that you might want that is further away. Uh, and this has been, I think, a useful thing to understand from a policy side, right? That this is a problem. Uh, and you can also understand why this is a Google-driven process, because YouTube is a lot of bandwidth, and Google would really like uh, to put pressure back on the ISPs to say, well, hey, we shouldn't necessarily be paying. Uh, we should keep this free peering thing. Look, it's these bad cable companies like Comcast that are trying to charge money and are holding out on putting in these more cap these cables so that you can get YouTube. Uh, and the answer shouldn't be us Google have to pay Comcast. The answer should be we should have some regulations where Comcast has to like put in these cables for free for us. Uh, the fourth thing uh, is Teardrop. You've probably heard about this. This is a leaking platform uh, for whistleblowing um, that is run by a bunch of newspapers. Um, and it's also open source, like all of these. And I think the, the thing that is interesting is we are learning a lot about proposed laws and about uh, sort of trade uh, processes through whistleblowing, right? Like the way that we are preparing our community responses to things like SOPA and to uh, changes to neutrality laws and able to have demonstrations against them is not by like seeing them when they actually get proposed, but by seeing them a couple months earlier when someone leaks them uh, to the press and <coughs> the articles actually come up in time to prepare a response. Um, so having this back channel to learn about these things earlier seems to be the way that you get public comment on regulation at this point. Like this, this over the last couple of years, seems to be the new normal of the way that the public like gets to have its angry reaction in a way that sets policy in a proactive rather than responsive way is, is through a whistleblowing process, which is weird. It feels a little messed up, um, but, but seems to be the reality, right? And, and that would be an indication that maybe we should work on these tools and make sure that they are, you know, working and plausible to use so that we can maintain this civil discourse. Cool. So how do we take tools? How do we then do something useful with them uh, and go back to shape policy? So, so taking this around. Um, the things that we learned from this first generation of, of internet freedom, from, from looking at repressive countries, um, Censorship today typically has a legal basis. So when I look at China and say, you are blocking all these websites and that's like a repressive thing, they'll say, no, no, look, it's, we've got this all written out, it's totally legal, like, and, and, and there's very little blocking of content or manipulation content or, or sort of limiting foreign access to things that is somehow illegal or, or that we're gonna call out and say, look at this, you're doing this horrible thing. and, they'll, and the regulators will say, yeah, it, it's regulated. This is policy, like we voted on it. it this is cool. What's the problem? Um, and so we need something more than, than just sort of calling this out to, to shape that. Censorship and these restrictions around the world are much more often uh, implemented by private actors, right? When I can't get to something, it's not because of some server that a government is running that is blocking the access or slowing it down. It's because Comcast or, or someone has decided that this isn't in their interest, right? The reason I can't get to Facebook, you know, to see, you know, I don't know, pornography is because Facebook has decided I can't see it, 
right? It's not, it's not the government blocking this because of some social norm that they have. It's, it's Facebook deciding they don't want to put up with the liability and risk and therefore just deleting it proactively before they get any complaints from the government. Political speech is going to continue to be one of the main triggers where you look at new stuff happening, right? We've seen this play out in our election and hacking and, and now a, a counter uh, sort of push towards free press, right? We're, we're maybe doing criminal charges against WikiLeaks. Uh, Stephen Colbert is now being investigated for joking about Trump. Uh, like we're, we're, uh, we're going to continue to see political speech as sort of the, the place that we're testing this because this is uh, the, the, t the battleground for political stability, which is something that's very important to a bunch of countries. Um, and then I think the final point that, that is pretty clear is that when you look at these walled gardens, the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, whatever of the world, it's much harder to understand what they're actually blocking, right? They'll, they'll give you these sort of fluffy statements about their community norms and what sorts of content are okay. Um, but if you want to actually understand from a data source what they're actually doing, like what content actually is getting taken down, that's something that they know and aren't going to tell you, right? I don't, I don't know how many tweets Twitter has deleted. I don't know how many posts Facebook has deleted. What does it mean if, what does it mean for Facebook to have even deleted a post? Because Facebook doesn't delete posts. Facebook just makes the post not seen on other people's walls, right? I still have posted it. And maybe if I look at it, I can still see it. It just didn't show up on my friend's stream because their machine learning algorithm decided it was not a thing that would get you to look at it and look at their ads. Um, so there's these very weird gray lines that are very hard for us to have any accountability of, well, but that was actually an important thing. And so maybe you should have shown that because I cared about it. Um, these lines start to get very gray. Um, and we have very little insight of our, the discussions that we want to have being somehow manipulated. So basically done, but, but let's, let's finish with sort of what we want to get out of this and how we might want to do that. So how do we keep the internet a place that is conducive for new free open source software uh, involvement? Uh, where new projects can show up, where we get reasonably low prices as consumers, and where we can express the ideas that we want in a, in a sort of community way. Is, is the strategy to have these sort of big campaigns where we get everyone on board and set regulations? I think that's part of it, right? We, we have had a lot of success with grassroots campaigns, like I was saying at the beginning. Um, and if, the, if we think about ourselves as the community that is not only wanting to make new projects, but also is the development community that is employed at all of these companies, then we as individuals can pressure the companies to change this, right? So we as a community are in a pretty, uh, important place in terms of setting the policy for this because there is so much self-regulation of the industry. Um, and you have seen that, you know, the blackout by Google, uh, where they, they showed this on their main screen uh, against SOPA, was not because Google decided this was in Google the company's interest. It was because all of the employees at Google said, we really don't want this. Google the company, because we the employees don't want this, you need to do this. So. Um, there's a big movement right now called Tech Solidarity that came out of uh, Pinterest, uh, where a bunch of Silicon Valley companies are trying to say, well, look, we need to do something about this in a self-regulated way because no one else is doing it for us. Um, and maybe that gets us somewhere. As individuals, I think there's a bunch of things we can do. Um, collect measurements, so having data, uh, watching for things changing technically and, and yelling about them so that more people can go on and look and say, well, this changed and this is bad. We need to actually understand technically when neutrality gets violated so that we can actually have that in a responsive battle rather than two years down the line trying to argue, hey, what you did back then was bad. Um, as individuals, adopt journalists. So find journalists who are writing about this stuff and help educate them. It's pretty easy. If you email them, they get very excited uh, because they also want technical people to like answer questions and interview and so forth. Um, call your representatives. Uh, if you fax them or call them, they, they actually get very excited because that's how they communicate. Uh, email doesn't work quite as well. Um, 
And then as a technical community, we can build the services and get our users invested. And that's then how you, how you cause this to grow, right? Is, is that um, we have communities, the communities care, now there's many more people who care, right? We, we as developers and as, as this community of technical people uh, have the ability to, to force multiply our impact by, by involving uh, the people around us. Uh, and then for neutrality specifically, use VPNs, encrypt your traffic, make it hard for them to differentiate, then it's less valuable for them to do shitty stuff. Cool. Uh, we've got like five, eight minutes for questions if people have other things they want me to talk about. I think we're all way in like, I, I don't want to be that guy who monopolizes this time. People probably have better questions than me. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, be that guy. <laughs> VPNs. Like I love the yeah. idea of VPNs, but it's taking money that didn't go to anyone, and now it's going to someone who like willfully violates the the law in the country. Okay. So uh, for a long time, the argument against uh, uh, music piracy, yeah, that was the nineties, um, was um, that you know it's funding terrorism. It's like it's not funding mm -hmm. terrorism. It's funding nobody, and like you know, kids get to listen to music, but. With VPNs mixed in, now it's funding somebody, somebody I don't know, who like is blatantly saying, "Let's dodge the laws." And so, so I think this is also this is true in two ways. So, so VPNs should we actually use VPNs? What does that mean? Um, there are a lot of sketchy VPNs uh, in multiple ways. I think the there there's this. I don't know if it's a new wave, but the 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 thing I would recommend for VPNs is there's these things like Algo which are basically grab some cloud machine somewhere in the cloud that's closer to the core of the internet and doesn't have a consumer ISP that's messing it up. Get a VPS there and send your traffic there before it goes out to the rest of the internet. And it'll be pretty fast because these cloud services are meant to be pretty fast. Um, and you're now not trusting some sketch VPN, you're trusting whichever of these big cloud providers it is that you're paying a pretty small amount of money for. And you can share it, right? For my $5 a month DigitalOcean or Amazon or Google or Microsoft VM, probably four or five people can use that same connection. So I can share it with family and friends and I get you know one or two dollars amortized per month as opposed to five. Can you spell that out? A-L-G-O, Algo. Is, that is com or? I think if you search for Algo VPN, you will find this. This is basically a piece of software that says, uh, here is a guide for how you sign up for Amazon and upload this image that has a, uh, OpenVPN running on it. And here's how you then connect your phone and your computer to, to use your VM. So trying to make it easier to do that setup. Uh, just two things where I think it's a very good presentation, but I think two things you were showing maybe are a little more gray than what you were yes. indicating. Yes, sure. So for example, when you're talking about private actors versus state actors, and you're saying it may not be the state that's doing this, it may be Facebook or Google. And I would dispute your dichotomy because I'm not sure that there are bright lines dividing these entities because the state and your large corporate actors is probably muddy. Yes, absolutely. And it's very, very gray and it's kind of misleading to say that you know this is a private actor doing this versus the state because they're all more or less all together. And the second thing I want to point out is it's also not quite that simple on the censorship thing because if I were to take it back historically, way, way back, and let's say the Trojans put in uh, an ordinance uh, during their siege by the Greeks, and they say, we don't want any non-domestic art permitted inside the walls of Troy. And the Greeks say, well, we'd really like to bring in this, we have this horse we'd like to bring inside your walls, and this is just a form of art. And they say, no, we are making sure we don't have this kind of art coming in. And the fact of the matter is that it is a Trojan horse, you know, that this, this thing that's being brought in, just like some things that are being put out on into foreign countries are in fact propaganda, or they are intended to be subversive, and they are directed at China, or at Iran, or at other places, or at us. And so it's very, very difficult to simply say some things, all of this is censorship, whereas in fact it may be protected, because in fact what's being censored is in fact aggressive. I don't know. I'm just hypothesizing based on you know, what you can just glean from your everyday living that things are not quite that simple. I think that's totally true. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I guess I think there's two things, right? So on the 
is this company versus is this government and how intertwined are they? I think the point that is worth remembering and, and being aware of is when we are putting pressure or trying to change policy, it's not purely one or the other, but we need to be thinking about both of these and what motivates them. So if you're looking at strategy for how do we get Facebook to open up um, or and, and like let me download all my data or, or make some open platform, this isn't going to be, you know, is, is this going to be, I pressure the US government to say, this now needs to be a regulation that your companies comply with. That seems pretty Herculean. Maybe I target Facebook directly and say, look, your policy's bad because then their lawyers are going to talk to the government lawyers and figure something out. And so you can put the pressure on the companies or you can put the pressure on the government and you just need to figure out which of these you have better leverage and better arguments against. Um, but both are, there, there's definitely a negotiation happening between those two players, at least, and you need to figure out how that negotiation is going to happen <coughs> and then counter pressure. Um, and then on censorship, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's national security bases, right? There is a reason why this is happening. It's not just to make us unhappy or to, to keep us from you know, enjoying good things. Um, I think the, the point I would argue is that the internet came out and was this great utopia of we're going to move past the, the previous level of things and now we're back to where we were and we should try to hold on to this ability to say individual person to person communication is a thing that you know we are have gained from the internet let's keep that being a thing that is unrestricted where if i am talking to someone i know on the internet i should be able to say what i want right that is my first amendment right it is like saying it in person and we should hold firm to that being a thing the ability to then broadcast that on a large platform is something that is much more gray right so do I get to promote my news article about my Trojan horse? Well, that's that's one thing. But should I be able to talk to my friend and say something that is bad about the government? Yeah, probably. I would say that that's true. I don't want some company just because I'm saying it over their wire to then like stop me from saying it. Right now, for for any means of communication, we've certainly had wiretapping and we've had government surveillance, and that will continue. And there are ways that that will happen, right? And, and we can have an argument about how hard we should make that. So does the government get to watch the wire and watch all the traffic passing through it and automatically extract the things that they think are bad and then survey all those people more explicitly? Or do they have to hack individual end devices and watch on the end device, right? Do they get to then tamper with the post office or do they have to like go and sneak into my mailbox in my home? Right, we have, we have a conversation here about how much proof and how widespread this surveillance can be. But I think that's, that's different from saying, yeah, and we're going to just blanket stop all communication on this subject. That's not something that we've done in postal mail. That's not something that we've done in terms of person-to-person -person communication. So I think there are some, law, some lines that are worth pushing for as, as a as a thing that we want to have in this communication medium, I guess. Cool, thanks everyone.